Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. Welcome to today's slightly rescheduled live stream uh, because last week we had some weather issues around the globe. So thanks for uh, your flexibility and uh, joining us again on the rescheduled date. So today is not about me or Capture One or a little bit about Capture One. It's uh, more about our guest, Joe McNally, who I'm going to bring on now. Hey, Joe, how's it going? Hey, David, how, how are you doing? You all right? Very well, thanks. Very well. I'm just going to say, don't, don't worry that Joe is looking a bit low resolution. Um, the screen sharing we're, we're using tends to give a bit more bandwidth to uh, the screen share, which is kind of what we're looking at. Sorry, Joe, we're not here to, to look at you. Just listen to you. Which, that is <laughs> a, a wise decision. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today, Joe is going to take us behind the scenes a little bit uh, in Tokyo at the uh, Olympics obviously. Uh, for those of you listening in our webinar room, please feel free to pose questions to Joe as we go through it. We're more than happy uh, to pause and, and answer your questions. So Joe's going to tell us a little bit about his experience at the games and then we'll look at a couple of edits in Capture One. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, yeah. And you can uh, pop a question or two along the way, David. Um, always a pleasure and uh, I'll answer as best I can. Great. Okay, so let's bring capture one up on screen so we're good so we can see us and uh, capture one so over to you for the for the next bit all right uh, well welcome everyone thanks for tuning in and thanks to capture one I'm very honored to be um, part of a, a small part of the capture one team and uh, kudos to David Grover he's a wonderful teacher and uh, evangelist for the program I've learned a great deal from him so it's always ha uh, I'm always happy to have these chats and um, as I say, it's, it's an open book. Um, answer questions uh, as I can, um, no holds barred, you know, ask away. And I'll run you through um, the recent games. I'm gonna start a little bit before those games because you know, how you end up at the doorstep of an Olympics is, is kind of a bit of history and uh, can be a little convoluted up and down, you know, as the life of a photographer is. And I've been doing this a long time, and uh, I don't count myself as an Olympic veteran. I've done four games, but there are photographers out there. There were photographers in Tokyo who I know for many years who uh, have done 10, 12 Olympics, you know. So, um, but as everyone was saying, no matter how many Olympics you did, nobody was really ready for the Tokyo Games amidst a pandemic. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, 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 I guess not. No, I'm sure that was the last thing anybody predicted, right? Yeah. So off we go. Um, my Olympic history started many years ago in 1984, believe it or not, Los Angeles. I was woeful. I was a babe in the woods. I did very poorly, and my pictures reflected that. Okay, and off and on you have history with the Olympics and not necessarily the games. You know, when you grow up as a publications photographer, almost every major publication in the world has some sort of glancing touch. Even if it's a fashion magazine, a sports magazine, news magazine, they acknowledge the presence of the Olympics because it's such a worldwide event. So in 96, I took the clothes off the American Olympic team. That was my only involvement in the Atlanta Games. And after that, you know, uh, when you do something like that, I became the naked guy uh, <laughs> was was, uh, that, was that a good uh, a good accolade to take? <laughs> I guess. I mean, as long as, thank God, I kept my clothes on. My subjects were the ones who were disrobing. Mm -hmm. uh, and Time magazine asked me to do this Time Canada cover of uh, their uh, the the coming Sydney Olympics, which I was at. But my best moments of the Sydney Olympics occurred before I did a walk up for Sports Illustrated on the new metal sports, which was big production, high technology. A lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, photographic slate of hand, if you will, to present new metal sports in a new light. And then I went to Tokyo, uh, went to Sydney, and again, I didn't do all that well, uh, but I did learn a rueful and very valuable lesson about covering the Olympics. Always keep your camera to your eye, even when the event is over. This is Rulon Sanders after he um, beat the big Russian, the Russian King Kong, as Alexander Karelin was known. It was a tremendous upset. That's his team there. Uh, word gets around. So I was invited to Beijing to photograph their 
uh, Olympic athletes uh, in front of various kinds of monuments. I've always loved oddity as a photographer, you know, the, the curious juxtaposition of elements, you know, so I did that in Beijing. So Olympics, you know, even even though you might not physically be at the games, you stay involved because, you know, it's a it's an amazing thing to work with athletes who are pitched at this level, you know, so and then off to Rio. I shot Rio for uh, Sports Illustrated. Did reasonably well in Rio, though, again, the Olympic baubles, you know, um, I had signed on with an editor at Sports Illustrated to do a portrait of Rio, not so much sports, a portrait of Rio, which I was very excited about. And then that editor was fired immediately before the games. And the editors looked at me and said, you know, I was coming back with pictures from the neighborhoods and people and this and that. And they were looking at me like, this isn't Michael Phelps. Go cover some sports, you know, so I did. You know, and, and and that was my Rio experience, which was dominated, of course, as the games were by the very large and talented personality of Usain Bolt, uh, which was pretty amazing. And then given that walk up, you know, I'm moving fairly fast here. You know, just let me know, David, if I'm going too fast. Um, <laughs> no, it's all good. Given the walk up aspects of my Olympic life, um, working with Zuma Press, which is a small but a prestigious international um, photo agency just distributes to publications all over the globe. I started working in Tokyo in 2020, thinking the games would be happening in 2020. And I started looking at Japan um, and Tokyo as a, as a mood piece. You know, uh, you do some very strange things um, when you're looking for pictures that are different, like laying down in the busiest intersection in the world and having just laugh as they go by you with a fisheye lens. Is, is that um, yourself in, uh, in the crossing then, Joe? Yeah, that's me right there. <laughs> uh, stripes laying down. You do some, I mean, you have to have a very high threshold of embarrassment as a photographer. <laughs> Absolutely. <It's> really, really <laughs> what could be easily perceived as dumb stuff. Um, and, you know, I looked at traditional, you know, uh, you know, uh, Tokyo and, and the environment, the amazing Japanese culture, and also the updates of, you know, the, the Japanese fascination with technology and color and, and, and just, you know, pop culture icons. This is at a restaurant. And that young lady is a skateboarder who was one of Japan's best hopes for the new metal sport um, that debuted this past Olympics of skateboarding. So what I was trying to do is kind of overlap the culture of Japan. Japan and Tokyo with its, you know, a relationship with sports. Um, Japanese sports are getting more international. A captain of the beach um, uh, soccer team is born in Brazil, but now a Japanese citizen. So we trekked down to uh, to photograph him. He's the captain of the team. Um, Hiroto Oharo, uh, Japanese leading surfer. Surfing was um, a new metal sport in uh, in Tokyo. So. I got to look at other aspects of culture and, you know, the changing aspects, you know, uh, young girls are being trained as sumos, which is, was a revelation to me, Absolutely. you know, in this very traditional uh, Japanese sport, the Japanese tradition of archery, very laden with ceremony. And again, back to the, the lights and the lasers of, of Tokyo and the, and the baths and the international aspects of, of the burgeoning sports scene in Tokyo. Rugby is a hugely popular sport. Um, sumo training, you have to eat. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> um, and Japan and Tokyo in particular has always been, for me, kind of a science fiction city. It has, especially in the rain, has uh, you know a, a relationship with uh, Ridley Scott and Blade Runner and all that stuff I watched as a kid that still stays with me in my head um, and uh, one of the legendary athletes uh, gymnastics um, legend in Japan who won medals at two games taking him to the symbol of the country and that became a package for Zuma so you have to plan a lot about an Olympics to actually kind of walk in the door and put a camera to your eye and and these shots you took the, these were taken like in the for the preliminary for 2020 or for yes. this year yeah yes yeah, so i shot these in january february of 2020 and then had plans to go back for cherry blossoms and then had plans to go back for the olympics which right. COVID obliterated yeah as did plans for everyone uh everywhere because at, so, this, at this point tokyo was still a go wasn't it as far as my memory extends yeah yeah 
how naive I was. I came home, you know, when I was still traveling and I came home and Annie, my wife and I were talking and we we're like, ah, no, nah, they're, they're going to have the Olympics. It, Come it, on, it'll all blow over. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, little did we know. Um, but um, the games did get rescheduled and then you start really working. Uh, you have to, as a one person show, you know, um, over at the games, I had the backup of my studio, of course, uh, helping with social media and orchestrating things. You have to grid yourself out, uh, identify the sports you are interested in, identify the athletes, identify where you're staying, and that will dictate, you know, how quickly you can get to venues. And you have to plan all this out and get established the bus routes and and the the timing of all of this. It affects whether you can do only one venue or maybe two venues, or maybe you could squeeze in three venues in the sprawling city of Tokyo. So, so, so this is all preamble work. What was your main avenue of transport to get to get around the venues? Because looking at the, the Tokyo map of venues and knowing what travel in Tokyo is like, and you're carrying five tons of gear, I would imagine, or at least a, a fair amount of gear. What What's the easiest way to, to get through to all these venues? Uh, the buses is really in Tokyo is the only way outside of a certain system they had of approved taxis, but by and large it was buses because the thing about going to Tokyo it took four and a half hours to clear the Tokyo airport. Right. Yeah. Over regulations and the saliva tests and this and that, and then you were only allowed. I had to hard quarantine for three days in my hotel. Right. And then you were only allowed Olympic approved transportation, which meant that a bus came by regularly in front of your hotel. You got on the bus and you went to the transit mall, which was a hub and spoke kind of thing. You know, the buses would all come in. You'd get off at the transit mall. You would have your venue picked out. You'd find out where that bus was was at the various, you know, locations at the transit mall. Go there, get on that bus and go to your venue. There really was no other way of doing it. So, uh, so you couldn't just hop in a taxi and go from A to B? No, no, not unless, unless it was an Olympic approved taxi. Um, right. They did have certain vouchers and, and cab systems that were set up that were dedicated to the games. But the thing about being in Tokyo is that you had uh, every morning I had an app. It's a very app driven Olympics. I had an app <laughs> I had to check in. I had to send my health report in, how I felt, my temperature, all that sort of stuff. Okay. And uh, the app could track you. Uh, so if you decided to, ah, you know, the heck with this, I'm going to take a regular <laughs> taxi and I'm going to stay out a little bit and have myself a couple of beers, they would know it. Wow. And they could yank your credential. Yeah. Several um, members of the press over the course of time were sent home. Really? Interesting. So yeah. you played ball, you know. Um, and you looked at who was going off, what were the, the events that you were interested in, and tried to uh, establish a plan or a grid. This is where Annie Cahill, who has uh, worked with Nikon for many years and is very involved in our social media, she runs our social media, was extraordinary in helping me just establish uh, direction, grids, and this and that. And then, of course, time to depart, you are tested, all of this you get you get documentation you have to maintain for me i'm very conscious about something like this i know i'm going to go for about 25 straight days with very little sleep and 20 hour days and working 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 so you know bring my bags of vitamins <laughs> you know and then you're shot out of a cannon the opening ceremonies that's it you're off the cliff and there's yep. no going back and uh, the opening ceremonies was strange and wonderful. You know, what can I say? This is shot with a remote camera. Uh, this is a, um, a Z7 II camera with a, uh, fitted with an eight to 15 millimeter zoom fisheye. And it's running on a remote, which is next to my position and clamped on a railing. And I kept that camera going while I was photographing through longer glass, the events that were down or the dancers and actors and this and that, the entertainment, if you will, mm -hmm. out on the field of play. You know, so, and, you so, know. so how far were you from that remote camera? Were you able to keep an eye on it or did you just clamp it up there and hope for the best? No, it was pretty close to me. Yeah. Though, you know, um, you know, at these stands, there's oftentimes, especially at an opening ceremonies, there's oftentimes in one position uh, where I was, there were probably 60 or 70 photographers 
And so right. multiply that by one or two remotes a piece. So there's cameras everywhere and everybody's respectful. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I grew up in, in, uh, in New York, you know, where if you had cameras up like at a marathon or something and the competition was across the block, they'd come by and they'd snip your remote cords. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that doesn't happen at Olympics. There is honor amongst photographers. Nice. Um, and then the closing, you know, and this is actually just to pivot to Capture One for a minute. This is where Capture One just really shined for me because I was editing this stuff on the fly, opening up shadows. And this frame, when I looked at it in my in my grid, uh, didn't look all that cool, you know, or colorful. But I opened it in Capture One and opened some shadows and did a little vibrancy and et cetera. Uh, via the program and it became a picture that got transmitted and used so uh, You know tip of the hat to David and the crew at capture one um, And then you know, uh, I'm kind of running you through this a little bit in a in a bit of a timeline um, You know surfing was the first uh, I, I tackled rowing rowing was the day of the opening ceremonies, but I'll cut straight to surfing here and the uh, Again, a new metal sport and harking back to my experience of the previous year photographing Hiroto, who was a Japanese surfer. He won his heat but did not medal ultimately. But I had never shot, you know, uh, surfing before. Here, here's the thing. You get dropped into this as a photographer every four years. Mm. And you're shooting sports that you haven't shot for four years or you never shot. Unless you really are a hardcore sports photographer. Like, uh, for instance, John Chang was there. Um, good friend, wonderful photographer. He's the staff photographer for USA Gymnastics. So he shoots gymnastics all the time. You know, I, last time I shot gymnastics was in Rio de Janeiro. Right. Uh, so you have to really adapt and, um, and think your way into the sport, do some reading, and there's no way you can really practice, you know, but you react. You have just have to hang in there and react as quickly as you can. And you stay with the athletes after their performances, striding up the beach. Um, uh, she eventually won the gold. You know, American lass from California, you know, nice. surfing capital of uh, the United <laughs> of States. You know? <laughs> and then you look at positions, right? You try to identify because the positions that you're going to be in uh, will dictate your lenses and how you can work. In uh, This was, um, that's a, a 200 to 400, I'm sort of back away. You can see photographers down you know, I would point to them, but you can't see that. So, so, so you so you have the desert. So the the photographers have designated zones for each venue, essentially. And, exactly. And you get a map of of each of the venues with like you are allowed here, here, here kind of thing. Yes, and every venue has a photo venue manager. Thankfully, right. I know some of them over the years. But you can see the gentleman down below. There's photographers. Uh, you know, looking at their cameras, they have blue vests. Those are our are, uh, are pool photographers. If you had a blue vest, okay. your pool which meant that you could be in the tighter, smaller number of photographers who are down close to the action. I'm long lens back away from the action. So by comparison, this I shot in Sydney with a 24 to 70. You're right on the action. I was able to get this picture, you know, and it got wide play, but I couldn't do anything like that for fencing. Uh, in Tokyo because I was I was kind of far back a little bit. I didn't do all that well at fencing this time around um, That you know, I look for oddity and that was like this particular German fencer is doing the behind the back stab yeah. Which I don't, think, I don't think is in the books. No Impromptu move so once you uh, settle into your photo zone Are you allowed to move or you kind of have to pick it and, and suck it up? It depends. Uh, at fencing, you could move because it was, I wouldn't say sparsely attended, but there wasn't an, an enormous crush of photographers at fencing, at least on the day that I went. You know, when it gets to be the finals and the medal rounds, you know, photographers start, you know, really packing in. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Of course, at an event like Simone Biles, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, at gymnastics, she generated a tremendous amount of news. Those positions got packed. That was a get there three to four hours early, Oof. you know, kind of a deal. Yeah. And, and camp out and lay claim. It's like you putting know. your towel on the sun lounger. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. Though uh, it has to be a little more definitive than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but sometimes you wouldn't even know where you were going no. uh, the night before because. 
the way the this was the first time I had ever experienced this. Usually, uh, at an Olympics, you go, well, I'm going to go to you know um, weightlifting today, and you can just go, you yep. know, pending what your editor tells you. Um, but here, you had to apply. Okay. Uh, again, because of COVID, and it was all app driven, and you would get an approval code, a canceled code, or, or a rejection code p- pending your you know, status as a photographer, the organization you represented. Obviously, the, the pool photographers uh, are representing millions and millions of readers, you know, Getty, AFP, mm-hmm. uh, Reuters, the Associated Press, New York Times. These are the big, you know, kind of, you know, distribution outlets, really, for pictures from the Olympics. So obviously, they get priority, as does NBC. When you give somebody a billion dollars to broadcast an Olympics, yeah, they pretty much put their cameras wherever they wanted, even if the still photographers didn't like it. Yeah, the, the TV right, or the, or the figures going around for the TV rights. I know in Europe, it was uh, like Eurosport and Discovery Plus. And it was, yeah, it was some pretty uh, eye-watering numbers that were going around. So yeah, I guess that gives you a a seat at the table. (laughs) Um, I've got a question from just racking back um, a little bit. Matt and uh, Simone asked a similar question. So Matt was asking about the remote triggers. Is that Pocket Wizards or or something Nikon branded perhaps? And what about interference? If there's a bunch of you up there, is it like, are you channel nine? Or, you know, is it like uh, who who has what channel uh, affair? Good question. Um, it's, it's generally driven by pocket wizards and the channels um, at the beginning of like it, they mostly go to the pool photographers. You have to register your channel right. and stay on the channel or you'll step on somebody else. There were a couple of instances of that. Pocket wizards have come out with a very sophisticated remote trigger now called the Raven, um, which uh, was just kind of debuting at the Olympics and has an enormous capacity. Right. Uh, very sophisticated unit. And uh, so photographers were experimenting with that. But the Olympics, let's put it this way, is not the place to experiment. Um, no. <laughs> you go with what you know. Because yeah. these events and uh, the athletes and their singular achievements will not be repeated. In that particular instance with my remote, I used a little Nikon trigger because I knew it wouldn't inter- interfere with anyone else. Because being up there, I was not registered. I didn't have any of my channels registered. So I dare not use a pocket wizard. Um, for fear of triggering a colleague's camera. So yeah. I really kind of shrank my remote presence to a very near nearby camera uh, mount and triggered it with a small Nikon uh, remote. But, they, uh, but, but the industry standard or the assumed standard at such event is Pocket Wizard then? Yes, the plus threes are a very, Pocket Wizard plus threes are the dominant unit. Hmm. Very, uh, very dependable and uh, they, they're everywhere. Really, yeah. you're everywhere. <laughs> nice. Um, about c- questions from Taro, who was looking for you in the press room, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, Sorry, Mr. Taro. <laughs> and Jim, uh, who asked a similar question. So Jim was asking, were you allowed any assistance to, to set up, uh, like to bring an assistant with you? And h- how do you stake your claim to your spot? Is it a case of leaving a tripod and a camera or is it is it a bit more official than that yeah um good questions uh no assistance you know uh, the big organizations like a getty would have um people back on staff supporting the photographers mm-hmm. but when you're out on the field of play there's only room for you yeah. tripods are not allowed um you can only use a monopod okay and uh the the way you you get to a position is if it's a highly desired event, for instance, or competed for, you simply get there early and then um, hope for a measure of bladder control <laughs> while you stay there literally for four hours. Wow. Uh, uh, prior to the event even starting. As photographers assemble, you know, you're, there's banter and this and that. And it's like, hey, I'm going to put my stuff down. I'll be right back. You know, I'm going to hit the men's room. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. There you know camaraderie and uh, and excellence really amongst the photographers who are covering you know, you have amazing photographers there like Doug Mills from the New York Times um, you know and Chang Lee from the Times you know just wonderful wonderful uh, you know experienced photographers so they you know there is this um, 
measure of camaraderie and, and cooperation once things get going. But if you want to get there and stake something out, you have to get there. Yeah. I mean, hence, you know, my day is generally started. Um, I r- would roll out of bed around 4 a.m. You know, Oof. I would practice. And thankfully, the family mart down the block was 24 hours. I could get a sandwich, start my day, load my gear, plan things out, and head off. The heavy days, of course, were uh, days when I had to also bring my computer with me, transmitter, uh, you know, to transmit pictures, uh, you know, um, you know, power cord, you know, hard drives, etc. There were other days where pressure wasn't so high to get pictures out so immediately, like for instance, surfing. And uh, I would just get on the back on the bus and carry those cards with me until I got either back to the hotel or to my locker. I had a locker at the main press center and I had a locker at the athletic stadium and you could leave your computer and stuff there. Okay, great. Uh, Good question from Sharon, which I think uh, ties perfectly well with the image that we can see on screen. Um, so you're probably going to answer it anyway, I would think. How do you decide which camera and lens to shoot with or take? Are you taking everything or do you juggle between uh, all of them on site? Um, you know, there's always regrets if you don't bring the right equipment with you. Absolutely. Um, good question. Uh, flexibility is key. Uh, hence, zoom lenses are a absolute, you know, primary lens. So what you see on the bed there did not go with me every day. It was the range I used for, you know, 16, the Olympics extended for 16 days. You would shoot at either end of it a little bit. So all of the shooting maybe was accomplished in like 18 days. So what you have here is everything from an 800 down to a zoom fisheye. Uh, A couple of Z cameras there as well, Mm -hmm. but camera of choice as it was, I'm sure, for photographers shooting other systems, Sony and, and Canon. For me, the camera of choice was the Nikon D6, which is the flagship camera. It has an amazingly accurate um, autofocus response. It's also a quick camera, 14 frames a second. And so when you're, um, hence my totals, I, <laughs> I just, you know, coming back, you know, as Capture One is becoming more and more of a partner here at the studio in terms of my own personal workflow, I just finished that ingesting my entire Olympic take into a Capture session. And courtesy of Capture One, I now know I shot a little over 53,000 frames. Um, <laughs> that's, so that's a lot of gigabytes. Yeah. That's a lot. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It uh, totals out around 1.25 terabytes. Wow. Um, okay. And, um, so I, uh, so this is, you know, you, again, that's where the maps and the grids and the knowledge of the sport come in. Mm-hmm. You can guess, you know, uh, hopefully get a, make a good guess at the lens that you want. If you're looking for something special, um, not that it's easy to do anything special, but say I wanted to work min depth of field and I was at um, table tennis, I would bring a 200 F2 and work at F2 with a very fast shutter speed. You know, to see if I could get a slightly different look, mm-hmm. if that's possible. I oftentimes brought an 800 with me. Now, an 800 is a lot of glass, um, yeah. but it enabled me to. I'll sh- and I'll let me let me go forward here, and I'll show you a few examples. Um, Wh- which one is the 800 in that that pile? The 800 is the one on the far right. Yeah. Uh, um, on the lower lower right hand corner of the frame, above it is a 600. Then you have 70 to 2, you have a 400 right in the middle, you have a 180 to 400 on the far left, you have a 200 F2 on the upper right, and you have a 300 2.8 uh, on, also on the upper right, and the ever-present bag of Lysol wipes, my cab vouchers, <laughs> my business cards, my locker keys. Yep. And in addition to applying on apps to get to venues, there were things called high-value uh, events, gymnastics, athletics. To, in addition to um, the app, you had the IOC had to issue you a ticket, and that's also what you see on the bed there. And if you didn't have a ticket, you could not go. Right. So uh, I was very blessed to have um, a couple of wonderful relationships at the IOC, and I was covered for gymnastics and athletics. I did not see a single swimmer. No. Didn't go swimming at all uh, for strategic reasons, but I'll go forward here. Go for it. Um, NPS, you know, is a wonderful, wonderful thing to have, you know, um, and they loan equipment and assist photographers with technical issues and repairs. 
But the 800, for instance, you know, I knew I was not associated with, um, you know, Reuters or somebody, a pool position. So I knew I would be up and away from the field of play a little bit. So the 800 made sense at athletics on certain evenings because I could reach this with a clean background. Uh, that's the Italian who eventually shared his gold medal, which was wonderful. Oh, yeah, emotion. that was great. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, I could shoot hurdles from the same position because I could reach both places by virtue of the longer glass. So you're thinking like, OK, how can I'm only one person? How can I maximize my coverage tonight? and get as, uh, I might not have the primo position, but like the 800, for instance, has such amazing compression that it stacks up the hurdles into a graphic. So I look for things like that. Mm. Um, having the 800 with me and also a secondary lens, um, uh, the 180 to 400. So the 800 would be on a monopod, the 180 to 400 would be on the floor or on my shoulder. I would switch, this is a 180 to 400 for the triple jump, and then I could reach across the field with an 800 and get um, a reverse angle on the high jump. And that was, again, just maximizing, you know, the your ability to cover from a variety of angles. Absolutely. And um, Paolo was just asking, are they, are they cropped those 800 shots, or is that pretty much the, the field of view? <clears throat> That's camera. full. That's full frame. Nice. Uh, I have a couple of crops here where coming up that I'll show you. Um, that I uh, also show the original frame. Cool. Nice. But this is a full frame shot. Um, this I pushed in just slightly because there was a bit of a of a distraction to on camera left. That's something you deal with all the time. Television cameras, officials, um, you know, stanchions, guardrails, you know. Uh, if it can get in your way, somehow, seemingly, it will get in your way. Um, so you're looking for clean backgrounds also, too. I, this was um, a worthwhile background because it was one of the few instances that, you know, you had people in the stands. Those are photographers across the stadium. But you're looking for some sort of breakup in the monotony of the seats. Mm. Yeah, I was just um, thinking that looks suspiciously like a, a bunch of photographers from the other side. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, gymnastics, you know, uh, is a challenge because um, when you're on top of the action with long glass, they move very fast relative to your position. And if you have not seen the routines before, you know, like a jump like this can be a surprise. Um, and also you're making um, gambles, bets and compromises. I chose uh, who knew that Simone Biles would make this vault and drop out of the competition. Mm. I was anticipating her making her circle of events, and I chose based on balance beam, et cetera, and that was my position. It was not a great position for her vault. Though even now, I'm not a gymnastics person, but it seems to me, even rotating in space for an excellent athlete like her, it does seem like, yes, she is a little off her line here, and that translated into her dropping um, out of uh, the events that night. Mm -hmm. um, she got a lot of support. That's NBC, whom I... Uh, is up there supporting her and then of course she drifted down and was a support to her teammates I was able to get this down by the balance beam um, you know yeah, that's, pensive that's pondering, you know as as you would imagine you know did I do the right thing and it turns out yes I I, I absolutely think she did the best thing for her own health and definitely. her own well definitely you know and so that left a tremendous burden on Sunisa Lee wonderful uh, gymnast who won the gold um, in the individual. She performed magnificently with, uh, you know, a lot of pressure on her. So that was my position that I had sorted and meant that I had to, for the Simone vault, I was panning left and going long. Not much of a background, a little bit of an awkward angle, but you place your bets. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you also, you like to work tight, right? You, know, you want to work tight, but you pay the price for working tight sometimes, you know, you miss a hand or fingers, uh, you know, etc. And so you're wanting to go with tight action, but in with gymnastics on a balance beam, when you go super tight, you lose the point of reference, which is the beam itself. Um, you know, and you adjust downwards and then you lose the legs. You know, <laughs> I, I, I like a couple of the odd aspects of these pictures, but an editor will look at you and say, 
you know, I can't run this. Yeah. <laughs> Are you crazy? crazy? <laughs> you know? And then, of course, you can really, really have too much of a long lens on <laughs> and, and crop one of the, the poor young gymnasts in half. Um, so, um, but then you stick with the action because, uh, as I learned, over, over the times that I've photographed Olympics, oftentimes some of the most significant pictures occur after the event is over. This is Simone and her teammates. They won the team silver. Mm -hmm. And then you go back. You know, you have to follow the rules. Okay, this was on the buses, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, as bad as or, or as voluminous as a New York City taxi when you get in. There's all the placards and everything else about what to do. There was um, some of the lovely gentlemen who rotated on shifts at the hotel. Uh, when I go back to the hotel, I could not leave the hotel any more than 15 minutes. Really? I had to sign and sign back in. Okay. So the only place I could go was just down the block to the family mart. And that old family that's mart. Where I, <laughs> yeah, that's where I basically ate um, or got my food from for 20 plus days. Um, and uh, there's all my receipts, you know. Um, and uh, um, <laughs> I published this on my blog and my, my good friend Ernie Grafton's wife is Japanese. So she looked around, she hunted through them, and Ernie came back to me and goes, Joe, I'm seeing a couple of Coca-Colas in there. You shouldn't be having all that sugar, you know. Um, and it got, it get, you know, it gets a little, you know, it, it gets lonely, right? Because yeah. you see the inside of an empty bus. You see the inside of an empty hotel room. You go to the family mart. So I, I ended up, like, having playing games with the, with the, uh, the toilet in the hotel lobby. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, you amuse yourself in any way you possibly can, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's the loneliness of the long-distance spit test. And they set up all these cubicles where you would have to go every three days and spit into a tube and have yourself tested. Um, but athletics has always been a favorite of mine because of the variety. Uh, uh, and also, too, you know, a lot of the marquee athletes, you can see the there's the field of photographers just below me there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, there's a lot of photographers there, you know, that's a lot of expensive equipment, uh, trained on these athletes. Um, and there I am, you can see the 180 to 400 on the floor, 800 is on the monopod. And that's a position that I was up above and I was able to reach athletes. Occasionally I would even attach a TC 1.4, an extender to the 800. Um, one thing, and I apologize if I'm telling anybody that which they already know, you know, this is pretty logical. One great way of captioning, you know, because if you're at, at heats, you know, you, it'd be four five, six heats. It could be, you know, 40 runners, 50 runners, mm -hmm. even more. How do you keep track of that? At the written notes you have afterwards that are distributed by the press center are fine, but you have to be able to recognize who's who and what lane they're in. So the in-camera captioning, you know, just keep photographing the scoreboard. All those blue, blue frames up there are the scoreboard, the starters, the way it finished, what lane they are in. So you know that embedded in your frames is um, are all your captions, should you need. And you can't sort it out, you know, via the paperwork afterwards, you go back to your actual take. The beautiful thing about, um, also about um, photographing over time at an Olympics is that you don't necessarily, I don't have a relationship with Alison Felix, though I admire her from afar tremendously. Uh, on the left is, is she's winning silver in Rio. On the right, she's winning bronze in Tokyo. And Kip Yagon is just a marvelous runner. Gold in Rio, gold in Tokyo. You know, so you see these athletes and the way they perform over time. And it's a really, it's a privilege. It's an absolute privilege. Um, and then you uh, experiment. Uh, the heats are when you experiment. You take a risk. You take a chance. Not when the gold medal's on the line, but and you have to deal with stuff like here's a would have been a nice picture except for all the junk in the way, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and the, the hurdle Hurley lays. I kind of like the graphics of this. Mm, definitely. Breaking, breaking from the start, you know. Um, you can, these are your moments as a photographer where you can play, literally play, um, and uh, turn something into a bit of a painting or uh, an impressionist view of legs and runners and color. 
So you're tracking and you can either purposely blur or you pan and hope for the best. That's the experiment that you're, that you're engaging in. Trust me, when you do this, you have lots of bad frames. You know, yeah. you're at maybe a 30th of a second or below, um, and you're looking for the camera to be able to seize on like one aspect of the picture that might stay sharp. And you can get lucky, but you won't get lucky unless you try. So this picture got a lot of play and it became a picture of the day. And that's a, what we call a snap zoom. Uh, and uh, the, uh, this got, it, got, it got fairly wide distribution via uh, Zuma. This is the men's 3,000-meter uh, steeplechase. And it's during the day. It's a heat. So and 3,000 meters, you know, experiment. They're going around and around and around and around, you know. So some I shot, you know, for sharpness and others I shot um, for, you know, uh, a, a different view, something a little bit on the odd side. Um, you know, there's my position uh, for the for the balance beam. That's a 180 to 400 on the camera. You can see the folks below me there in the tan photo vests and their computers um, uh, pushing out pictures. And you make a compromise. I wasn't in the best position for Simone's balance beam for pure action, but hopefully I was hoping that when she came back for the balance beam, it would be such an emotional event for her that the aftermath would be worthwhile photographing right. as much as the action was. So here she's, she's heading off the beam to her, her dismount and there she is. Okay, I had a clear line of sight from my view for that full frame. Great. Okay, and you can see the relief on her face. Olympics at the end of the day are about a athletic excellence, but they're also about emotion. And um, and then this is one of my favorite frames from the games. Cropped in a little bit. There was some uh, stuff out of focus. NBC cameraman just below on the bottom of the frame with his fuzzy out of focus head and camera. I cropped that out. <laughs> The hands of her coach coming in, and then Suniza, and the, just the the relief mm. that she had come back, did her routine, won a bronze, didn't win, win, you know, like the gold, but she was so relieved and so happy, um, and I was just really happy for her as uh, you know, as a uh, excellent young athlete, and so you position yourself and you hope for things like that to happen. This is Yulimar Rojas. And I tracked her, and I tracked her, and she was compelling to photograph because, I mean, look at the physicality. Yes, yeah, incredible. Yeah, she yeah. is, I think, about six foot three, <laughs> and um, and she's the first Venezuelan female gold medal winner, and the country went nuts. So here's the thing: this is you stay with the athlete, and um, she immediately looks to the scoreboard. She begins to realize what she had just done. It was a world record and a gold medal. She leaps. <laughs> Her training friend um, won silver. Joy. So you just hope for a sequence like that, and you stick with it. And there's some cropping going on there. This was um, These were all horizontals. I didn't have time to change my frame. When you, you know, you're moving your zoom to a degree as she moves, but I wasn't going to miss something by trying to flip, flip vertical. No, so the beautiful no, no. thing about shooting something like a DX, uh, a D6 camera is that you have a tremendous amount of resolution and wonderful high ISO capacity. I was routinely at ISOs at track from anywhere from 4,000 to 6,000. No, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, Bob just commented, you're a master at storytelling with your photography, Joe. Outstanding. I, I agree. Thanks, Bob. Um, just a question, uh, because it was timely with, with one of those shots, uh, your behind the scenes shots. There, there was a guy hurriedly uploading uh, his, his pictures to his agency. Um, yes. A, a few people were asking, you know, for your workflow, uh, are you shoot and upload or, or was that... Um, I guess could be event dependent, but were you always trying to upload immediately or Zuma was happy to, to wait a while? No, Zuma would want images as quickly as I could manage. Um, mm. And uh, so I, I tried to accommodate that as best as I, I, I can uh, or I could. 
So I would have my laptop. The first thing I would do would be to, uh, to dump the entire card onto a drive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're, you're worried, you know, that you're going to do something stupid. <laughs> so yep. You just make sure that that entire take and, you know, Capture One's got some wonderful ingest now and importing tools where you can delete and select. I did not do that. Um, I, uh, for a take like I generated from the Olympics, I would just good, good, bad or ugly, you know, the, I, I saved it you know, put it on, put it on a drive. Hmm. And then the, um, the tools I used for cropping and, you know, we're going to get into some retouching here in just a, a, a few, I imagine, but, you know, super basic. I'm, I'm, you know, basically goosing the image. And then I also, I had presets, uh, in capture one. Okay. That, uh, were accommodating the zoom press and social media. So I would hit export and, those images would immediately translate into folders on my desktop corresponding to the recipe name mm-hmm. of social media and uh, Zuma Press. And so working like that, I found um, to be um, extremely valuable. You know, um, tip of the hat to my, my buddy, MD Welch, who's a wonderful photographer based in Rio and has IT like in the brain and he's a huge fan <laughs> of Capture One. He helped me out prior to the games just kind of uh, you know, and, and since the games, you know, just kind of, you know, trying to smooth out over some bumps and, and help me, um, economize my time because that's it. You know, um, you know, I, you know, I have a dear friend, David Burnett. He came up to me at, at athletics one night. I was in the press workroom. He put his hand on my shoulder cause I was asleep. <laughs> You know, it was it was midnight, you know, right. and I was trying to transmit pictures and I had just basically passed out in my chair. You know? So it's like time yeah. to go home, Joe. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yes, you are, are translating into your computer. You are sizing as you go, uh, especially for a high pressure event like Simone Biles being deciding to come back. Yep. You know, I kind of thought I was going to drift from gymnastics because the, some of the intensity was gone, you know, mm-hmm. after that first night. But then she decided to make a comeback for the beam and <clears throat> the press was there. I bet, you know? yeah. And there's about 100 questions uh, on the same subject, so I won't list everyone's names. Uh, shooting RAW or JPEG or, or both? Uh, I shot RAW only. Um, historically, I've, I've generally speaking, I had a RAW JPEG file, but too much time. Um, and too much space. Mm. So uh, I eliminated the JPEG for my equation. That is potentially anathema to certain um, sport shooters who um, are shooting a, a JPEG relentlessly because mm-hmm. at those front positions, the pool positions, say, for the finish line, the pit position, looking at the men's 100 meters, for instance, the women's 100 meters, yep. the, um, those, those finish, those dramatic finishes, um, those photographers are wired into their editors over Ethernet. So right. they are shooting a, an optimized file for transmission. So as they're bursting the camera, their editors are seeing those pictures populate on their screens. Not so with me. I was not wired into any main system. I was in Rio. Uh, I would jack an Ethernet cable into my D5 and it would translate several miles away to the Sports Illustrated office. So Cool. Uh, again, another another sequence that you stay with. Um, this is when Chilemo won the bronze by diving. Really? He just <laughs> threw himself at the floor, and he narrowly won the bronze. And two runners from Uganda, wonderful. I mean, their expressions, one, gold and silver, and you can see Chilema from the U.S. laying on the track. And I really um, <laughs> I love this this particular frame just because you've got this sort of camaraderie amongst the runners. They care for each other. They celebrate each other's um, you know um, uh, you know accomplishments, etc. And and you, again, you stick with the athlete. Uh, this is a gold medal win and a world record. Uh, and boom, yes, I if I could lift that much weight, I <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be happy. Yeah. Too. <laughs> definitely would and framing is important you know I'm a little off on my tee over here got a pretty good frame with symmetry there with the Olympic rings you know so um, so framing is important in a game in games like this you don't want to have this lift occur and be sort of off so uh, again I got to 
weightlifting early. I selected my position. The vexing thing is the judges are always in the lower part of your frame right. um, from the middle. And so I uh, shifted the beauty of ca cameras, etc. cetera. Uh, nowadays you can shift your field of view into panorama 16 by nine, you know, et cetera, eliminate some top and bottom, et cetera. And you track athletes. I looked at this, um, this young table tennis player and he, he was, uh, it was China versus Germany. And I saw his eyes just regarding, you know, a lot of that happens at table tennis. It's why you go. Cause you hope for that moment. Mm. I saw his eyes and then I shifted my position. I'm thinking something's got to give, something's got to give, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. And then you get lucky, you know, that's, that's luck, you know, <laughs> um, awesome. you're yeah. observing, uh, uh, you know, what potentially could happen between here, which is a pretty good picture and here, which is mildly unusual. Mm. That must, it must be one of the hardest sports to, to cover table tennis. Cause I watched it quite a bit of it. Um, and just the speed at, that they're moving at is just, you know, I, I can't imagine trying to capture that with a, a long lens really. No, it's, it's very hard. If you, if you don't start before they swing the paddle, yeah, you don't have a prayer of having the ping pong ball in the picture. No, because it's gone. it's gone. So yeah, <laughs> anticipate and start your drive running while they're just winding up. Because mm -hmm. if you start it while they're bringing it forward, the ball's gone. Yeah, it's gone. yeah, it's yeah. too late. <laughs> Um, I love to shoot wrestling. Greco-Roman is wonderful to shoot. I'm start moving a little faster here, David. Um, and depending you, I mean, you know, uh, if there's questions and this and that, you know, and I know we have some, a bit of retouching to get to, but, um, um, I, I tend to really like photographing the lighter weight wrestlers cause they can really throw themselves around. Mm. The strength to body weight ratio is big. The, the big guys are like big bears. They just grapple and kind of paw each other you know it's very <laughs> rare that there's really intense like throwing action or something you know but the lighter weight wrestlers are amazing um this is an example of i was framed too tight with a horizontal this is full frame so when i transmitted this i quickly uh cropped it to that because i felt the vertical aspects of the arms played but no way i can you know forgive myself really for being just uh, uh, too tight on this and losing that upper arm that would have been a beautiful graphic element to keep you in the picture mm -hmm. and um, I'm just too tight you know um, likewise uh, conversely I tend to um, like the bigger boxers because given their height you there wasn't a lot of elevation for the uh, boxing pictures right. so 400 here the the smaller boxers tended to get even more interrupted by the ropes the bigger boxers, you could get them up and get a clearer view of the punching and the action. And then moving fast here, um, shadows, you know, this is new metal sport. And here's here's an embarrassment, you know. Um, I just started, I kind of gave up, you know. I gave up. I just thought, you know, everybody's photographing everything here, so I'll just I'll just try to catch a shadow. Right. And that's all I'll shoot. I'll shoot shadows. And uh, Jimmy Colton is the chief editor at uh, Zuma. And Jimmy and I have known each other for 40 years, and he's an amazing editor. And I sent this in. I thought it was just a shadow picture, just a graphic. He dived in and found the scuff on the shoe, the tip of the shoe, and identified the skater in this picture <laughs> from the scuff on the shoe. And it ended up being um, transmitted. It's the gold medal winner. Nice. So there's a little <laughs> bit of embarrassment for me yeah. that I just thought, oh, you know, I'll just send this in. No big deal. It's a graphic. And Jimmy was like, no, man, come on, <laughs> you know. Um, and so his energy as an editor dove in and found the fact that this young lady, Sakura, skated magnificently and won the gold. Yeah, the, the skateboarding was just such a brilliant event, actually, to watch. Well, the, the, the skateboarding was brilliant to shoot as well, though skateboarding and um, beach volleyball was so hot. I shot skateboarding with two ice packs on my head and covered with a sun cap and a drenched towel around my shoulder. Same thing with, uh, with the uh, beach volleyball. The sand got to in excess of 110 degrees and they kept turning it over so the athletes could walk on it. But at the end of the day, just closing here, um, the Olympics is really about emotion, mm. excellence, passion, 
durability, striving, uh, and then the athletes, when they, they care for each other, they celebrate, uh, they uh, acknowledge, you know, they, they help each other, and that's really just a wonderful thing to see, to be witnessed to. And really, truly um, amazing to see the world gather around and celebrate these these incredible people, which was a lot of fun. Um, and you know, I can get into a little retouching now because my the social media move in uh, Capture One helped. Uh, you know, I, I I was very active on Instagram while I was there, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then it was time to go home. I was there early at the Tokyo airport, as I tend to be, deserted Tokyo airport, and then. Goodbye, Tokyo. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's really a shame that you didn't get a chance to enjoy Tokyo, really, or at least eat out somewhere as opposed to Family Mart. That's, uh, that's I guess, the only disadvantage of how it was this year. Yeah, no, I didn't see Tokyo at all, except through a tinted bus window. Yep. And, you know, um, so I have a small folder here. Um, these are all NEFs. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you can see here, if I was just if I was just going to hit the export, um, you know, I had these two checked off, and they. Uh, um, I have a different subfolder I've been working on now, but for the games, I would export to um, the recipe name, um, two folders on my desktop, and the designation was to a uh, process folder that I I had just sitting on my desktop, and I could pull from. And that was a wonderful way to um, hopefully uh, stay organized uh, to the degree that I could because I was using borrowed cameras, which didn't have necessarily a frame numbers that were lining up. Right. And um, I jumped in on those. And once, I, once you jump in and start rattling frames, you don't want to rename. So Capture One was really valuable in terms of an organizational push for me um, in an immediate sense. So Awesome. So that's kind of, I mean, um, that's that's you know a little bit behind the scenes. So much of it is not about the shooting, you know. The shooting is like five minutes of terror preceded by <laughs> eight of work, you know. Um, but where I, you know, where Capture One and, and uh, um, you know just like that, when I first saw it, I was like, ah, eh, you know. And I've gone to school a little bit, you know, with tutorials and with David on the magic brush, but I did not use the magic brush. In Tokyo, I actually stayed with my older version of Capture One because mm-hmm. I didn't want to update during. No, that would be completely yeah. insane to do any kind of software update at an event as important as the Olympics for sure. Yep. Yeah. And so you know, something like this, just you know, I was able to make a couple of quick moves. Um, you know, say for instance, to open up the shadows here because I was like, ah, I think I overplayed this, but. You know, um, Capture One being non-destructive, I was able to bring this back, and and um, I mean the drone thing that they did with the globe was crazy. Yeah. You know, um, and you know controlling highlights and establishing a little bit of clarity. Some of the smaller details, I, I think I probably did some structure in here to uh, uh, to help myself out. I oftentimes you know, play a bit with levels that will also establish a bit of contrast for, uh, you know, where, and I'm, I'm kind of watching the histogram too, because this histogram is kind of understandably way over on the, on the, uh, on the left hand side. So I'm, I'm careful to not overplay, but I'm also careful to not lose detail in the middle there. Um, and that was at twilight as twilight hit. Now, you know, I, Trust me, you know, when I, I realize there's a bunch of people on the line who can make pictures sing and dance in Capture One. <laughs> I'm no threat to David Grover, as I always say, you know. Um, but these are the very quick moves that um, that I made to kind of, you know, maybe a little more um, contrast, this and that. And, you know, you, you shoot a reasonable frame, and there's really not a heck of a lot to be to uh, to be done, you know. Um, I might have cropped in on this. I I would rarely have ever he- used a healing brush, like to get rid of this gentleman here, because mm-hmm. in an auditorial situation, that's really kind of a no-no. You know, you don't want to be doing that. Right. You don't alter anything in the photograph. If it's there, it's there. Cropping is fine. 
you know, um, cropping is fine. So um, yeah, know, that it does seem to be more culturally over the past few years that that is definitely a no-no in these kind of situations. Yeah, yeah there's been a lot of controversy at the World Press, people mm -hmm. dropping things into their pictures. National Geographic ran afoul of it. They had a, a night sky story that turned out to be bogus and, um, you know, stitched together, this and that. So you just have, if somebody's, you know, as annoying as it might be, you know, if somebody's in the picture, somebody's in the picture. Um, this, for instance, you know, this is, this is an 800 millimeter lens. So I'm using a small cluster of AF points. And, you know, in this instance here, that's Sidney McLaughlin who uh, won the gold. And I goofed here, you know, um, I'll be honest with you, I goofed because um, the 800 has a lot of momentum to it when you're swinging it on a monopod and I got ahead of her. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I had a large enough cluster dropped on her where it still pulled the focus. But I, I chose this angle because the 800 does such a wonderful compression number. Mm -hmm you know, on the uh, Tokyo, 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 you know, et cetera, which was really kind of fun. So, you know, my, my first move in this, you know, would be to crop it a bit, you know, come in a little bit tighter. And I think ultimately what played on, on Zuma was really little veering towards the square side a little bit, but I can, I can kind of get my, my crop, you know, my, my DSLR aspect ratio back, uh, hit the V key, come up. Um, and, you know, I, you know, it's the the sharpening aspects of of this is right in with, um, you know, it, it corresponds to the camera that you're that you're using. Uh, in this instance too, I've got because this is a Neff. You know, I what I've done since then again. You know, tip of the hat to MD talking this out. I would go to Nikon flat. Mm -hmm. That would really give me a, the the most flat image I could imagine. And I would go film extra shadow, which would open things up even further. So I'm, I, you know, when I had the time to actually work through something, I would really start here, which is as flat as I can make it and then build from there. Would you think that's a smart move, David? Yeah, definitely. I, I, because I guess with the stadium lighting, a lot of it is top, top down, isn't it? So you're going to get the shadows when the, the athletes are in the starting blocks and, and so on. Um, so opening everything up like that, yeah, just gives you a, a great start point which you can dial back in the contrast you want. Sure. And for color, I would just immediately go to a universal where it's checked off and saturate everything kind of across the board because there's no, you don't want to, um, at an Olympics, like, yeah, there's colors to the uniforms and this and that, but you don't want to go overboard on saturating because like you know, yellow, oh yeah, you know, but then you know, turn her into a caution light or something, you know, so you want you to stay in the same register because everybody's experiencing this on television. It's lit for television, yeah. et cetera. So you don't want to um, go, um, you know, in terms of um, the, um, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, going outlandish, I guess, in your color is what I'm trying to say here. Mm -hmm. Not particularly well, um, you know, and, so, you know, going back in here, you know, I, I would, you know, there's no real shadows to open up. You know, I'd probably crush the black aspects, not that there's that many of them. Just get a little more density into things. Um, I already did a saturation move for the whole thing. I'd probably establish some clarity. The rain is a wonderful kind of unusual thing, but it also kind of softens your frame up a little bit. I do, you know, would you recommend, David, I did play a little bit with these, with the rain aspects, you know, and the dehaze, but I didn't want to overplay it because if you zoom it way up there, you know, you can kill the rain. Yeah, exactly. You know? No, I think actually dehaze would work brilliantly on that, on that kind of shot because the rain is almost acting like a atmospheric haze. Um, but like, you know, any tool, if you push it too much, it, 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 it's not necessarily going to have the right result. So dehaze on that shot makes perfect sense, actually, because then it will get rid of that that atmospheric loss of detail, if you like, but retain the, the water droplets, which are important. Yeah, and as I say, I was, I was um, um, prior, I, I did not use the magic brush, but uh, again, you know, um, instead of just doing standard vignette, if, if I, if, now that I have the time, when I was at the Olympics, I'll confess, I just, you know, I would probably just hit a bit of vignetting on this and mm -hmm. do a standard 
kind of encroachment on the edges. But, um, you know, here, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to, um, I found this, I'm, I'm finding this um, to be tremendously, you know, helpful, you know, and, and kind of, you can kind of conform it to the shape of the athlete and draw it and stretch it kind of like, you know, Gumby. And, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, you know, once the, once that's established, you know, you can, you can sort of, you know, mess around with your brightness and this and that. And, and, and play with things that, you know, um, that would affect just that zone. But to be honest, um, I would probably, um, I would, as I say, confess that it, during the games, I would probably just go to my vignette tool and take down the outer edges just a bit. Yeah, and the, and the vignette tool is actually a brilliant underrated tool because it's, um, it, it just gives you such a natural result, so I still, use that a lot if if yeah to be specific like if i really wanted to hone in on mclaughlin i would use a, a radial gradient uh, but if it was just to draw focus to the shot with a vignette the vignette slider just does a brilliant job because um it, it's not actually just an exposure adjustment if it was then like the the dark shorts on the athlete just out of frame would get really black really quickly so the adjustments going on with the vignetting is actually pretty measured and natural so if people haven't discovered it then go use it because it works really nice it does i you know and then you know again if i if i um you know i could be happy with this but also as kind of a final touch you know i might just play with levels just a little bit to see if you know to make her just a tiny tiny bit brighter and make sure she remains the star of the show that kind of thing awesome well so. unfortunately <laughs> well, you kind of overstayed my welcome no here, not so. at all not at all we could probably keep talking for for an hour and uh and and most people would stay um but i am going to ask a couple of other questions rather than just uh uh cut you off rudely so i've okay. just made some notes here there was uh, again a few people asking this question so sorry for not rattling off everyone's names um andreas was one of them but but how would you even get into or get to the point where you can shoot the Olympics? Can can anyone apply for accreditation, or do do you need to have the support of an agency behind you? Good question. Um, I was registered as a freelancer, um, but I was affiliated with Zuma. So um, it it is it it tends to be historically anyway uh, a question of affiliation. Like in Rio, I was assigned by Sports Illustrated. They took care of everything. I sent in my specs and my, you know, my height and my weight and all that stuff that they want to know about you. <laughs> and Sports Illustrated machine just ground through the Olympic system. And uh, a couple months later, my credential showed up. Right. And um, uh, here I was very much on my own pins to make the arrangements. So that was daunting mm. for me because, you know, a lot of computer stuff going on a lot of um i had my own hotel arranged i had to give that away and stay in an olympic approved hotel right. they gave you a grid that you could pick your hotel and pay for your hotel online etc and they were just so the density of application driven uh, you know necessary things I can't tell you how many times I filed my information and <laughs> and my, my ACR number, my accreditation number, over and over again for hotel, for when are you arriving? Okay, well, I answered that last week. When are you arriving? Um, you know, coming off the airplanes, et cetera. So the, the, the density of things that, you know, the lone photographer has to work out on this is pretty high. Hence, it was a team operation here at the studio. Lynn Del Mastro, our studio manager, and Annie, who is director of social media, we pooled our resources, you know, because it was just a lot to drill through. But yes, having an organization behind you is, is, is key. virtually yeah. necessary. Yeah. Uh, um, when, I, when I started working in photography uh, many years ago, uh, one of the first things I did was trackside motorsport, and that was almost impossible to get the good side of the fence without having some kind of agency behind you so i can't imagine it's any easier now but i guess determination is key you know if you have 
a body of good work that an agency would take interest in, then it's, yeah, agency first. Um, yeah, d and just to pick up on that about all the, the paperwork and hoops having to jump through, I could see from your experience that it could go very wrong very quickly if you didn't follow all the directives and rules and transportation and there seems to be lots of ways that your trip could have been ended abruptly. Oh, I was I was nervous right up until the moment I walked out of the Tokyo airport and realized, OK, I am here. Yeah. Um, the OCHA app, uh, which was the health um, app on your phone, which you had to download before you flew, was non-responsive and useless <laughs> here in the United States. Right. It came alive at the Tokyo airport. OK. So then you had to input a whole bunch of information into that. Uh, and uh, but here's the wonderful thing uh, about Japan and how they did this Olympics. There was a lot of controversy about it. I know that. But the Japanese people, the volunteers, the staff were unflaggingly nice. Yeah. Wonderful. There couldn't have been more of them. I mean, every turn you made, there were people saying, oh, yes, go here, please go here. Um, and uh, just, you know, shepherding you in benevolent ways i'll say that mm. you know so that my hats off to the japanese people for pulling off this massively complex thing at the time of covid yeah yeah it, it was an, uh, an amazing achievement really i was nervous myself that they'd get three days into the event and then the whole thing would be would be called off so i think it's a great credit to japan uh the people of japan and yeah as you say i know there was controversy but it, it's a monumental Thing to have pulled off uh, safely as well yep um, okay a couple of other questions and then I will let you go I promise uh, a few people were asking again sorry for not reading out everyone's names uh, how did you pick the sport and venue that you were going to pick was that that directed from Zuma or or a collaboration between you uh, it was um, collaborative mm -hmm. though I did really um, I, I, I did kind of behave as kind of an ambassador without portfolio. <laughs> they were happy to have me go cover stuff. Right. You know, at all times filling gaps. One mandate uh, that occurs with every agency is uh, uh, contracts are established with certain publications from around the world. Mm -hmm. And so certain countries will subscribe to an agency's output and therefore then it becomes uh, part of the agency's workload to observe a certain country's particular athlete or all their athletes. Right. Uh, so uh, Zuma has a um, very powerful relationship, for instance, uh, with uh, press organizations in Finland. Right. And that uh, became something, you know, that uh, all the Zuma photographers would always look for. Any of the heats, uh, the, uh, you know, events where the Finns were doing well or, or poorly, um, they, they wanted it all. They wanted news of their athletes, win, lose, or draw. So that was kind of a, you know, background mission. Mm -hmm. Got it. Cool. And let's just pick out um, the last common question. Um, a, a couple of people asked, I think you already answered it, uh, Joe, but in terms of, of choosing your images like culling and rating, you did everything I exclusively in Capture One, right? Or were, were you using uh, additional software like Photo Mechanic or, or something else? Yes. Oh. It, it, for the quick and, quick and dirty, um, you know, the ingest, Photo Mechanic just separated things mm -hmm. and I dropped them on the hard drive. But then I would pull everything uh, into Capture One and start rating them. Yep. And, uh, and then all the work that I did for post-production uh, was done in Capture One. And that is, that is something that Capture One has been a great gift to me. Uh, you know, as I always disclaim, I'm not, never will be a professional retoucher or um, super knowledgeable about, fo you know, post-production. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I've learned a tremendous amount about Capture One over this last year and a half. And it's become a great partner for me in my workflow. And what I'm doing now by introducing sessions, you can imagine I've got a lot of pictures on my rates. Yep. Uh, by introducing sessions, I'm starting to use the power of Capture One to leverage and save me time. So what I'm trying to get away from, is, as again, as my friend MD 
calls it, you know, my my clunky folder based workflow. <laughs> It's very polite. First to it as um, to leverage the power of Capture One in terms of um, you know uh, the the smart albums and and the um, uh, the dates, the keywords, etc. Mm -hmm. So I can make ratings now in Capture One, massive Olympic archive, and then just click on that and I have only my top images and it does it automatically and it does it beautifully. So instead of me hunting and pecking around in, you know, uh, the, the dark woods of my raids, <laughs> Capture One is uh, facilitating um, ease of organization in a tremendous way. So I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, because these images and don't stop being useful or commercial now, I mean, for the years to come, as a historical event, they potentially will still be called on for publication. So, absolutely, yeah. I'm yeah. I'm still filing images with Zuma. Yeah, uh, you know, still kind of you know trolling through the archive and faces are important. Uh, athletes who maybe didn't do well this time, but maybe will do well in Paris in 2024. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you need a picture then of how they did previous Olympics. Fantastic, great. Well, Joe. Um, I would say if people want to know more and read more Olympic stories, your blog is a good place to go, isn't it? Yep. yep. JoeMcNally.com backslash blog uh, or just plain old JoeMcNally.com brings you to my website. So that's uh, pretty easy to, I'm just going to type it in the comments, but um, I'm pretty sure people can remember uh, JoeMcNally.com without too much trouble I would say <laughs> um, so yeah. you've posted many stories there which are, I've read on the Olympics so I think if people want more inspiration uh, more information on what happens on behind the scenes the choice at family mart uh, dealing with the weather uh, great then, sandwiches great sandwiches it's true you know family mart is often a place where I've visited in Japan uh, Tokyo because they're everywhere um, you can pretty much buy everything. Uh, when I forgot my iPhone cable, Family Mart is the place to go. So, and ice, you can always get ice at Family Mart, which is handy. <laughs> Great, so thank you for everyone joining. We did record this as well, Joe. So uh, we did have a technical issue of sending it out to Restream Live, uh, sorry, to YouTube Live, but I will grab this recording and upload it to, to YouTube uh, relatively quickly so if anybody does want to watch again you can just head to YouTube uh, and find it there as well so uh, where can we see you next Joe where are you heading off to or, or what's happening in your world oh Lord um, next assignment is West Coast based I'll be heading to California in the later part of September it's a big production job we'll see how that all goes in the interim uh, I've got a couple of local things doing in New York Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, enjoy California. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Joe, uh, as ever. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to the, the stories. Uh, we're all very privileged to get an inside look behind the scenes on not only an event uh, as big as the Olympics, but also as big as the Olympics and technically challenging with everything else you had to deal with. Uh, so thank you. It's, uh, it was a great joy listening to it. Same back to you, David. Thanks to Capture One. Thanks to you and to everybody who tuned in. I'm uh, very honored to be here with everyone. Great. Thanks, Joe. And we'll see you soon. All right. Take okay. care. Bye now. Bye, everyone.